I went into this kind of pessimistic about the United States, but then I found out after reading newspapers from a hundred years ago, 150, 200 years ago, there's always, every generation thinks they're the last one that, that, you know, the world's going to, going to hell and you know, this, this is it. And to be honest with you, I think there are a lot of situations in us history, whether there is a, a better argument, I mean, living in in 1941, 1942, it did look like the world was coming to an end. Living in the 1840s, it, it, was, it was a disaster. Um, so it, it just kind of taught me that th things happen worse in this country, significantly worse, and we get through it. And I, I think some of the, the enduring values that we have in the United States will enable us to, to get through the, the next crisis. And that is hard work and being a people that likes to improve things. Now, is everybody like that? No, but I think we have an, enough people that believe in fixing things, making thing, 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 making the world a better place, innovating. And I don't think that spirit has died in the United States. Welcome to Excess Returns, where we focus on what works over the long term in the markets. Join us as we talk about the strategies and tactics that can help you become a better long-term investor. Justin Carbonell and Jack Forehand are principals at Validia Capital Management. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Validia Capital. No information on this podcast should be construed as investment advice. Securities discussed in the podcast may be holdings of clients of Validia Capital. Hey guys, this is Justin. In this episode of Excess Returns, Jack and I talk with Mark Higgins, financial historian and senior investment advisor at Index Fund Advisors. Mark is the author of a new book, Investing in U.S. Financial History, and in this discussion, we walk through our country's major financial developments over time. As Mark points out, history never exactly repeats itself, but there are usually corollaries we can look back to and learn from in financial history that can help guide our decisions today. From COVID to the great financial crisis to wars, periods of inflation, monetary and fiscal stimulus, history offer clues to how the markets and investors may react. You can learn more about Mark and his book at enlightenedinvestor.com. As always, thank you for listening. Please enjoy this discussion with Mark Higgins, author of Investing in U.S. Financial History. Mark, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you for having me, Justin and, and Jack. I'm excited to, to for the discussion. Yeah, I think it's going to be very interesting on a lot of levels. Um, we're going to use your new book, which is titled Investing in U.S. Financial History, Understand the Past to Forecast the Future. I think to see what investors of all different levels can learn from studying our country's financial history, the things maybe we got right, um, mm -hmm. some of the things maybe we got wrong, and then probably most importantly, how history can be relevant to many different times in the markets, in our economy, and how understanding that history can help, I think, in making long-term good actual decisions when it comes to investing and just understanding the market. So. Sure. That's going to be the the core of um, the discussion today. I, I would definitely highly encourage, um, and I was fortunate enough to get a, an electronic copy of the book, which appreciate you sending that over. But people that are interested in this discussion, you know, go check out the book. Um, it's obviously on Amazon and major book websites. Uh, Mark has a website, um, www.enlightenedinvestor.com. And just want to mention that stuff right up front so that people know where to go to learn more about you. Great. Thank you. You're very welcome. So let's start. You you kind of started the beginning of the book with the story around COVID and kind of what brought you into this project. So I, I thought we, we could start there because I think there's sure. that in of itself is just interesting to me. Yeah. I COVID-19, when it hit kind of February, felt February, March 2020, it caught everybody off guard. I mean, it was like, I mean, it's referred to as a sudden stop panic financial panic, but we really hadn't experienced one of those for a long time. And I was advising at the time, I was serving as an investment consultant, advising endowments, large endowments and, and pension plans. And to be honest with you, I was a little flat footed in terms of how to advise them to react. It, it just seemed like it was something that never occurred before. And once I had some more time on my hands, because we were in quarantine, I started just reading financial history to see if there was, you know, some precedent for this. And the more I read, the more books I read, called like 10 or 15 books at that point, um, after a few months, I realized that using financial history and stories that were similar to what we were experiencing in the present was a lot more helpful than just, you know, basing your advice on your own life experience or, or what was kind of going on in market at the time. And I also noticed that 
I mean, I still can't believe it that, that there was no book. There was no single book that recounted the full financial history of the United States. So I knew it was an ambitious endeavor, but I saw a huge gap in terms of, um, a, a resource, both for academia and for investment professionals. And I spent about four years writing it and that's how we got here. That is a pretty massive effort and a big lift because I think the book is something like, you know, 600 pages, including all the references and, the uh, yes. you know, um, index and things like that. But I mean, uh, four years and probably hundreds of hours, would you say? Something like that? Well, I mean, thousands. I mean, oh, wow. It's, it's, you know, we had, uh, we had done some discussion beforehand on some possible questions and, and just what the process was like. What you see behind me is evidence of what the process was like. I used to hide this because I didn't want people to think I was crazy, but, uh, the books or you know, I've read all of these books, some of them multiple times. Um, I don't know how many are there, maybe 70, I, I don't know, but I, I probably read about, I, I lost track, but call it 200 books. Um, probably three times that in terms of journal articles, studies, newspapers, and the process really was starting in 1790 and working your working i i immerse myself in history as a as a both living i mean i would literally spend weekends reading newspapers on the couch from like the 1800s and you know my wife he's always make fun of me but i'm like you know i have to feel like i'm actually experiencing what it was like to live then and uh what, what would usually happen is i kind of take call it a 30 or 40 year period i have you know notes scattered on the wall mapping out what happened and i would just take a step back and say okay what really happened here what what is the theme and how and how is this important for people in the present to know and then i would write you know a couple chapters and you know that later on i divided it into sections but there are key themes so there are about six sections in the book but that's how i did it it was just you know people ask me it was 85 percent, i would say reading and and note taking and thinking and, you know, probably 15% writing and editing. And that's why it's so hard it, to do a book like this is it's not, it's not just you know, writing based on your knowledge. You have to, you have to consume so much and synthesize it. And it was all encompassing. I mean, I, I felt like, I felt like I was in the past when I finally finished, I felt like I was coming from the past. It was, it was actually a real weird feeling. You referenced lo looking at the past to try to, to examine some of the events we're dealing with today. And that's what we're going to do with the interview. We're, we're going to talk about a bunch of things that are going on today. And we, we've had a lot of things going on that you can use yep. the past for. We've had inflation. We had COVID. We've had yeah, bank panics. We've had all kinds of stuff. So we're going to, we're going to work yeah. through all those individually. But first, I wanted to talk about like how you think about using history for investors. You know, on one so, hand, we want to understand history. We want to understand what happened. On the other hand, we probably don't want to think that it's going to repeat itself exactly the way it did in the past. So how do you think about like, as an investor, if we look back at different things, if we look at something that's going on right now, we want to relate it to history. What's the best way to do that? It, you know, it's, there are people that, that, that adhere to the philosophy that things repeat exactly. I, they don't repeat exactly. And, and COVID is actually a, a great example. What ends up happening is I, I feel like the best way to use the book and the way I've used the book and, and the research is certain events will happen, multi-year events, and you have to know different events from the past that give you the principles to understand how it's going to be dealt with. So COVID was a perfect example. The initial shock was, was not like 1918 and 19. It was actually like July 1914, when the whole world, literally within a month at peace, went to total war in World War I. And the shock was actually very similar to what we experienced in March 2020. Then after the, the worst of COVID subsided, you had the inflation kick in. That was a lot like the end of World War I in, in 1920. Um, the, I'm sorry, the end of World War I and the Great Influenza in 1919 to 1920. And understanding that helped, helped understand, helped me, you know, kind of understand that this is probably not going to be transitive or I'm sorry, transitory. And then now you're to the point where inflation has persisted for so long. The real risk is that we go back into a 1960s, uh, in 1970s, great inflation type of it. Now, I don't, I definitely do not think that's going to happen, but that's really the primary risk that the Fed is dealing with. So it's not that history repeats exactly, but the more you know about events in the past and the, and the key principles that still apply to the, the present, the better equipped you are. I do not subscribe to the philosophy of, I think you had, we had done some questions back and forth before this, and 
there were some comments on the turning and, and kind of generational changes. I, I don't really believe in blunt cycles that repeat. I do believe in specific events that repeat and take different permutations. Yeah, it's interesting. Like what you described is really like a lattice work type approach. You know, it's yeah. not like we find the exact event in history that matches what's going on. It's like we take this part and this part and we exactly. put it together. And that exactly. really like requires a huge understanding of history to be able exactly. to do that because you need yep. all those pieces to put together in the puzzle. Yeah. And, and, you know, things start popping up. Like, you know, a good example is the Silicon Valley bank run where that was, if you understood how, how bank runs work, you know, it was immediately clear that that was a major threat to the system. And the Fed was going to do one of those weekend meetings. And I'm on record, you know, writing this. They're going to do one of those weekend meetings. They're going to, they're going to step in aggressively and they're going to stop it because an uncontrolled bank run that has a, that is based on a systemic flaw, which this one was, you know, a lot of the, most of the depositors were not covered by the FDIC because they were above the $250,000 limit. That is a very real risk that can spiral out of control right away. And understanding what the bank runs look like in 1907, what they look like in 1921, 29, and, and then early 1930s, it, it was very clear what the Fed was going to do. They had no choice. It's interesting. You know, one of the things I find myself doing all the time, you, you reference Silicon Valley Bank, which we'll talk about a little bit more later, but this idea that whenever I see something going on, I always go to like the most immediate thing in history that seems similar. And I'm like, that's what's going to happen. And you see that all the time. Like with yeah. Silicon Valley Bank, you saw this bank you saw with 2008. Everybody's like, oh, here's Silicon Valley Bank happening. We've got a financial crisis on our hands. We go to 2008, but that ends up being the totally the wrong way to look at it. But it's just the way yeah. I guess our recency bias works is we've got that most recent event yep. in our memory. So we go there first. This was like nipping a, what was a nice, relatively isolated event into turning into a systemic event, but it was not the GFC. And I, and I don't know if you got to the, the, I know you have an advanced copy of the book, but when you read about the global financial crisis, which I, the chapter is called the, the great shadow bank run, because that's really what it was. It, that That's very different than what we saw with Silicon Valley Bank. Going back to COVID, um, you talked about it briefly, but that was one of the things that I found really interesting in the book is you really got into detail of the great influenza um, mm -hmm. and, and kind of what that happened and then you know what happened with it and then what it led to after that. Can you just talk a little bit about that experience um, of the past and sort of how it relates to what we see now with COVID? So, you know, the the inflation that came after World War One, I, I, I would say, honestly, it was more a function of World War One than it was of the great influenza, but, but the great influenza did contribute to it. And by, by the way, just kind of a fun fact, the reason why... I refer to it as the great influenza is because the Spanish flu was really a misnomer. The, it actually, the, it's almost certain that the flu originated in Kansas in, in March, 1918. It was called the Spanish flu because all the belligerents in World War I had these draconian censorship rules. So you couldn't talk about anything that could threaten morale. Pandemic flu was, that was killing everybody was thought to threaten morale. So. Nobody could talk about it except for Spain, which was, which, which is a neutral country. So that's why they call it Spanish flu because everyone saw it in the Spanish newspapers. But anyway, after World War I um, and the great influence of it, the second wave of the great influence was the most deadly in the fall of 1918. And after that subsided and after the armistice, armistice in World War I was signed in November of 1918, you had a similar situation to the end of COVID, but it wasn't really the end of COVID, but what, as the worst of COVID subsided in the spring of 2021, and you had a lot of things that were fuel for inflation. You had, um, it, you had, uh, massive, uh, stimulus. Now in the case of the, the post-World War One period, it was two things. It was a lot of, uh, exports and gold inflows because the U.S. was funding reconstruction, but it was also a lot of pent up demand where people during World War One, people were you want to spend a lot there with rationing. And then you couple that with the great influenza and, you know, all of a sudden you had a lot of pent up savings that got unleashed. So a very similar thing happened in the spring of 2021. You know, the, the worst of COVID subsided. You had a ton of cash on the sidelines because people didn't really spend it during the worst of COVID and it got unleashed. So it was a very similar dynamic. And this is the kind of thing where if you immerse yourself in history, it, it's kind of like instantly recognizable. Um, now I happen to be studying, happen to be reading about that when it, when the inflation started picking up, but these things are instantly recognizable the, the more you immerse yourself in it. Yeah. And going back to your reason you wrote the book, like you kind of had that experience where you said, I don't have enough knowledge of history. Like that, that's the same situation I find myself in, you know, then, and probably now as well is 
you know, like you said, to be able to instantly sort of recall all this stuff and, and put it together, yeah. you've really got to have that deep knowledge of history. You know, if you yeah. got a little bit of knowledge about what might have happened here and here, it just it's not enough to understand. And I got a lot of that wrong in terms of I didn't see anything coming, you know, with inflation following COVID, probably because, again, I didn't have enough of a knowledge of history. Yeah, I mean, nobody, I mean, even the Fed, you know, you don't see them referencing World War I'm still surprised they don't, you don't see them referencing World War One. but this was, I mean, not only was it similar duration, but although this one's a little longer, um, it, the, the causes were very similar. You know, it was, it was pent up savings that got unleashed. You had massive fiscal monetary stimulus. And it was, some, it was for different reasons it, uh, to some extent during, some of them were similar, but in, in 1918 and 1919, the Fed reacted the same way. Uh, they raised interest rates in January of 1920 by 125 basis points, and then another 100 basis points in June 1920, and the economy went off a cliff. Um, now, I don't, you know, clearly it's not an exact match because we haven't gone off a cliff yet, um, but it's just very similar dynamics. Yeah, this, that's an example people use, right, of, of what the Fed maybe has learned since then in, in terms yeah. of they, they've learned some from some of those examples through there and through the Depression They've maybe learned how to, and we'll find out here if, if they have, but, yeah. you know, maybe they've learned how to better use policy. And obviously they have more policy tools at their disposal now yeah. than they did then. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, can you just talk a little bit about that? Like how different, if, if we, if I was on the ground at that time, like, it seems like there's so many different things that would have been the case than now. I mean, we're, we take for granted all our technology and, you know, yeah. the Fed being what it is today and, you know, the fiscal stimulus being what it is today. Like how different did the world look back then? You know, I, I mean, I think it was more, if you're just talking about policy, I think it was probably a little more clumsy back then. I mean, we have a lot of benefit having watched the Fed make mistakes in the past. And I would, I would argue the two biggest ones were allowing the Great Depression, allowing the banking system to essentially implode in the 1930s. And then the second one was on the opposite end of the spectrum, which was allowing inflation to become entrenched. So, you know, I, it's kind of a general question. If I had to answer it, at a high level, I would say things are less different than you think. I mean, yes, technology has has advanced. Uh, the Fed has has learned a lot to act differently in response to crises. I think they act better in response to crises. But at the end of the day, human behavior doesn't change very rapidly. And I think things are, at a high level, things are more similar than people think. Yeah, that human behavior thing is such an important point. I mean, if, if you look yeah. back, and not just for people on the outside like me, but for the Fed and for everybody, you know, we, yeah. we can certainly learn from history, but we're not we're not going to get rid of the mistakes. Um, you know, yeah. no matter what happens here, we're going to, you know, the Fed continues to make mistakes now. You know, they have in the past. And part of it is just they have a very, very difficult job. Obviously, trying yeah. trying to look at everything and figure out what to do is very challenging. Yep. I want to ask more about the inflation um, because we, we are dealing with inflation for the first time in a really, really long time. And mm -hmm. for people like me, um, for my, my entire career, I really have never seen a bout with inflation. And, you know, you reference some periods we could look at to look at inflation. But, you know, the one that most often gets referenced is the 1970s. And I'm wondering if you could just talk a little bit about that, because a lot of people yeah, are he's, saying we're going to get a repeat of that. One, th that is the most relevant uh, period to look at right now, but it's not because I think we're going into it. I actually don't. It's because the Fed is in a position right now where if they make the same mistakes that they made in the late 1960s, we could go into that. But if you look at Powell's statements, if you look at most FOMC member statements, not all of them, but most of them, they're very well aware of the mistakes that there's been a lot written on it. They're, they're very well aware of the mistakes that were made in the late 1960s. And I, I actually just posted something today on LinkedIn following the last CPI report, but it just validated why it was very important for the Fed. They, they seem to be signaling kind of a dovish pivot in December of 2023. And you know, I wrote about it when they did that, that this is premature. And, but they did leave enough room to backtrack and now they're backtracking. And this is why, because if you, you abandoned, this was one of the big mistakes of the sixties and seventies. If you abandon monetary tightening too early, inflation comes back at even incrementally higher levels and it becomes harder, incrementally harder and harder and more painful to extinguish. And that, that is in my mind, that is by far the biggest danger. It's not that we're going into the seventies. It's that the fed needs to avoid making the same mistakes that they made in the late 1960s. Uh, to ensure that. And I, and I think they will. Just one comment there. It's like the market seems to want the Fed to lower rates and takes that as a positive. 
But yeah. yet, if that happens too quickly, and like you're saying, this inflation comes back, the actual long-term negative is much more. So it's like- oh, Absolutely. I mean, that was the lesson. That's why I took Paul Walker going up to 20% to tame inflation. It was entrenched in the economy. It was built into labor contracts. It was built into pricing strategies, built into the, the American mentality. And um, once that happens, it's really, really hard to reverse. It becomes incrementally more painful to reverse. And that, that's exactly what happened in the late 1960s and 1970s. Now, there are a lot of other reasons why that happened, um, fortunately, that are not present, one of them being a lot of political pressure. But, um, you know, I, I, I don't see that, that happening again. And, and I think the Fed's latest messaging and decision in January confirmed that, that, that they're on it. Yeah. And Powell seems to be, if he's going to make an error, it seems like he's going to make an error on being too tight. He, he seems to be he not wanting to repeat the, the you know, yep. the mistakes of the seventies. That seems to be, if he's going to make a mistake, he's going to make it that way. So it seems like he is going to stay the course here. I agree. This. I agree. With I, I think they were premature and I've been largely supportive of the fed ever since they started tightening aggressively. I think they, that little dovish tilt that they did in December was risky. Uh, I didn't think it was a huge mistake because they they left them a, they left themselves enough room to backtrack, which they did. But um, uh, you know, I, I thought that was premature in December. I'm just wondering if you have an opinion, you know, on Paul Volcker. You know, he he gets he is kind of known as the guy who broke the back of inflation. And yeah. we've had guests in the podcast who have sort of gone both ways on that. Who some people have said that's exactly what he did. You know, he did what he had to do. He broke the back of inflation. And other people were kind of saying the the forces of the '70s that were causing the inflation were sort of dying out anyway at that point and you know maybe he didn't have to do what he did so i'm wondering just as someone who studied history do you have an opinion on that in the, in the former camp that it, i'm assuming they're referring to some of the oil um you know the oil related the, the embargoes in the in the early 1970s or i think it was 73 74 that did add to the inflationary pressures but there there are there are a lot of papers that have been written it's pretty clear that the inflation of the seventies was a monetary phenomenon. Yes. Was it was amplified by some, some shocks like the, the oil price shocks, but it was absolutely a failure of the fed to maintain tight monetary policy when it was needed and contain inflation. I, I, I don't subscribe at all to the belief that this was something external and, and Volcker had nothing to do with saving. I think it had everything to do with that. Can you talk about, we've talked about the fed a lot, but we haven't really talked about why they exist. And, and that's an yeah. interesting part of the book. And that's something I didn't know. I, I sort of knew, but I didn't know as well as I should have. Can you just talk about the story of the past that led to the Fed being created in the first yeah, place? So the, well, the Fed was, first of all, was the third central bank. The, there was a, Alexander Hamilton established the first bank in that, in 17, uh, the charter was actually in 1781, but called 1790. And then it was eliminated for, I think, five or six years. And then the second bank came in and Andrew Jackson got rid of that. And he had a national banking system. The Federal Reserve Act was not passed until 1913, in December of 1913. And the real trigger to bring back a central banking system was the, the concept of currency in elasticity, which you had an interesting situation back then where you had a lot of farming kind of country banks would park their cash in New York City, and then they, they would take it out in, in the fall months and then kind of redeposit to kind of you know, do all the spending for harvesting. And then when they got their money back, they would, they would put it back into the New York city banks and call it January, February. It's a long story, but there are every, every fall. That's why panics would happen in the fall because there'd be a shortage of cash in New York city in, in the fall months. So they were always vulnerable to panics in like the September, October timeframe. <laughs> and what happened in the panic of 1907 is you had added to that. There was an earthquake in San Francisco in 1906 which would pull money abnormally out of New York City. And then you had the agricultural kind of pulls to the country banks at the same time. So you had a shortage of cash and you started seeing bank runs, uh, specifically on the trusts, which without getting into details, they're a little different than the national banks. What happened is this was kind of the high of J. Pierpont Morgan's career. He orchestrated a bunch of private rescues that barely prevented just an all out run on the system and collapse of the banking system. After that, there was enough momentum to bring back the, uh, the federal reserve and I'm sorry to take a step back. The, what a central bank does in a situation like that is will essentially provide emergency currency to banks to prevent bank runs because we didn't have that. J. Pierpont Morgan had to do 
I had to work as a private rescue. So after that, the experience was so traumatic. JP Morgan, JP Morgan died in, in 1913. And then the thought was we, the, the nation had really outgrown its ability to operate without a central bank. And that, that prompted the passage of the Federal Reserve Act of 1913. It's just funny when you hear stories about like shortages of cash in New York City, and then you think about where we are today, you think about how far we've come, like people hitting computer keys now and buttons on their phone, you know, to, to thinking about what the dynamics were like at a time like that. Yeah. I mean, it's, it was an interesting, I mean, what really caused the panic of 1907 happened, which was in October of 1907 happened 18 months earlier in San Francisco, there was a major earthquake and for reconstruction that pulled a lot of cash out of New York. So when you had the typical agricultural financing cycle in the fall month, they were already short and, and they were very vulnerable to the bank. Just talking about the Fed in general, you know, one of the ideas you hear a lot, and I don't want to get your opinion on if it's true, is since 2008 really has been a completely different thing for the Fed relative to what they did for the entirety of history in terms of quantitative easing and the size of their mm -hmm. balance sheet and the tools they're using. I mean, is that true? We've really seen a very different Fed since 2008 than we did for the yeah, rest I mean, of history? In some ways, um, I think the main difference, I, I, you know, I know we, we had a couple of questions and we were pondering back and forth on this. I, I think the biggest difference in the Fed today is, and I've thought a lot about that. Are they more, in, or are they more prone to intervention today? And they definitely are more proactive in response to crises, but I would argue that that's a good thing because their failure to be aggressive when they were needed in the past is what led to some pretty traumatic events. And the, it's kind of on both ends of the price sensibility spectrum. It's the failure to contain the bank runs in the early 1930s, uh, was, was, was really what allowed the, the great depression to severely deepen and extend. Uh, they learned from that and that's why you saw aggressive fed intervention in 2008 and 2009. And then the great inflation, I think they've learned from that too. If they had kind of caved to the demands of the market to shift to a more dovish policy earlier than, than they should have, uh, we, we could have another great inflation event. So I think the Fed has changed in terms of being more proactive and having a bigger presence in crisis. But I, I personally think that's a good thing. And, and if you look at the smoothness of the business cycle and the frequency of recessions and the depth of recessions, it does seem like we're better now than we yeah. were in the past. So it does seem like this stuff is helping. Yeah. I mean, some of the, the panics were just, you also, it's not just the Fed. I mean, the, we have a more diversified economy. Uh, you know, it, it, we have more effective regulation and stronger institutions. So it's not just the Fed. I mean, it was just, it, for those who have read or will read about the Gilded Age in the late 1800s, I mean, it was, it was a circus back then. There were, there were no rules and it, it, it was so bad. It was, it's hard not to laugh, but I mean, it was literally a circus. You had literally circus clowns becoming some of the major stock operators on Wall Street. I'm not joking. They literally were, you know, had clowning backgrounds. I want to ask you about bubbles because that's something when you study history, I think you probably can learn a lot about. And, you know, the dot-com bubble was, you know, very, very transformational for me because I lived through it. You know, we yeah. were running a company like in the tech space during then. And it was, you know, it was a pretty ugly situation. And now we have people talking about with AI that we might see another bubble. And I'm just wondering, what are the biggest lessons as you study bubbles through history? What are the biggest lessons you take from it? They're hard to detect. The, you, the hardest ones to detect are the ones where they're hard to detect because usually the ones that are the worst are based on a technology or a new product that, that actually has real value. And, and the dot com was a great example of that. I mean, the internet and e commerce was a, a tremendous invention. The problem is everybody starts pouring money. It, there's an under, you, you don't know when and how big it's going to be. So everybody starts pouring money in it. And you know, these, these types of situations are prone to in aggregate, there's too much money in whatever innovation people are chasing. And that leads to, to bubbles. And, um, I, I think AI in terms of comparison to history actually does remind me a lot of the dot com in the sense that there's there's definitely real value to the, the AI related technologies that are coming out. But if you look at people's advertisements, they don't, everybody, regardless of what industry you're in, is saying that they are AI enabled and, you know, there are a million AI companies out there. A lot of it's just garbage. So, um, it's a lot like the dot-com, you, you know, uh, Amazon came for the dot I mean, real innovation came from that dot-com error, but, um, you know, it's, it's just. It, Things like that are prone to a bubble because 
the magnitude and speed of the impact are undefined and people tend to overshoot. Yeah. And you, know, you remember back in the dot-com days, like putting dot-com after your name, like led to a doubling yeah. or tripling of your stock. It, yeah. it was, it was crazy. Just the same thing you're seeing with AI now, I guess you, people want AI in their name. And that's not unique either. There's a story from, I don't know where I read it, but there's a story from the 1920s during the roaring twenties where C, a, a company called Seaboard Airlines, which was a railroad company, uh, when it just went through the roof because people thought it was an airline company rather than a railroad company. I mean, just, just the name alone would, would, would cause the company to go through the roof. So you, you see things like that all the time. Yeah. And then to, to your other point on bubbles, like, it seems like we always, after the fact, want to say, oh, the bubble was obvious, but to your yeah. point, like, it's very hard when you're living through them, it's very hard to know if you're even in it or when it's going to end. Like it's, yeah. it's great to look at after the fact, but to, to do anything about it, it is very, very challenging. No, I would argue we probably are in one with AI in the sense that there's more over, are, are there revolutionary companies that are coming going to come out of it? Sure. But my guess is in, in aggregate, the investment there exceeds the value. One of the things you talked about earlier is this idea of shadow banking. And, and that's something you hear a lot now and you have throughout yeah. history in terms of like risks to the financial system. And one of the things I thought was interesting when I was reading the beginning of the book, you were talking about trust companies of the early 1900s, and you were mm -hmm. talking about this idea that shadow banking is not really a new thing. So can you just no, talk about that no. a little bit? Yeah, so it was a little different back then because you, you actually didn't have the Federal Reserve during, this was during the panic of 1907, but you had, without getting into the details of it, there was a state, more stable and more well-capitalized national banking system. And then there were trust companies that did a lot of the activities that national banks did, but they were regulated at the state level, which was required less uh, of a reserve requirement. It was just less regulated. And those were really proliferating in New York to the point that they had assets that roughly matched the national banking system, but lacked the protections and the discipline that the national banking system had. So when there was a run on the banks in New York during the panic of 1907, it was really the trusts that were vulnerable to that reason. And it's a, they, I would consider them a shadow banking system, even though you didn't have a federal reserve system at the time, but you did have a national banking system, which was stronger. What did like a bank run look like back in those days? Like it's right now, like, oh, I, like I mentioned earlier, you got a bunch of people hitting them, you know, buttons on their phone in Silicon Valley when Silicon Valley banks failing, trying to get the money out. It obviously looked a lot different back then. Like, yeah, what was it I mean, like on the streets during a bank run? I mean, I wasn't there, but you, you know, you have lines of people around the board. You have to go to the teller window to get your money out. And it's, I'm sure it was terrifying. People's life savings could be severely damaged or eliminated entirely. And you didn't have the protections that you have now. You didn't have FDI insurance, FDIC insurance back then. You didn't have a, a federal reserve system to, to help a bank that was technically solvent, but just didn't have the liquidity that they needed. So. You know, one of the interesting things, and I still can't find the citation, I know for a fact I, I read it, was that anything could trigger a bank run too. It didn't necessarily have to be the fact that a bank was poorly capitalized. There was one story where there was a line forming outside of a store near a bank and people thought that there was a bank run in progress. So they ran on the bank, even though there was nothing, there was nothing wrong with it. It happened to be located next to the store where there was a long line. So. Yeah, I'm sure there were scary sites to be old. Yeah, the bank runs are tough because there's not, I mean, there's really no banks even today that if every single depositor showed up and said, I want my money back, could provide right. it. Um, yeah, so I mean, a lot of it is, a, it's a confidence game. Like you have to have confidence in the system and in the bank. And, you know, if people yep. lose that confidence, that's where you get in trouble. Yep. And that's why you have the safeguards that you have today. You have the Fed that can provide liquidity if needed in exchange for, you know, taking assets off a bank, uh, less liquid assets off of a bank's balance sheet. And you have FDI, the FDIC insurance is very important because that eliminates the incentive. I mean, everyone does have a rational incentive. If you don't have, if their deposits could, you know, disappear and they're out of lock, they have an incentive to get theirs out before everyone else's. So there, there is a real incentive to run, which is why you have to have these protections that we have today. What is the history of FDIC insurance? Like, how did it come about? Well, the, the interesting thing about the FDIC insurance is that uh, Roosevelt's and I think it was Carter Glass did, did not support it. Um, it was actually, uh, forget the, it, it was a congressman from a Southern state, I think it was Alabama that, that really pushed to have that into the legislation. And 
the reason why they didn't have FDI, this is another way that looking at the past kind of people always are trying to solve away this problem. The problem during the bank runs in the Great Depression were, were the small banks. It, it wasn't the large banks. Almost all of the runs were on the small banks that people felt comfortable putting their money into the larger banks. And the reason that, that Roosevelt was against, and I, I believe it was Carter Glass was against putting FDIC insurance into the legislation is because they feared it would prop up the small banks who were, who were weak and that, that just didn't seem productive. Um, but you know, it didn't end up going into the legislation, but that's the history of it. It almost didn't. And it's one of the most valuable things about the, the Glass-Steagall Act, uh, was, was having that in there. Just curious. Um, you know, we're in a period now where the country is very divided politically. And obviously we're in an election year. And so it's even more heightened with the two candidates that we have in mm -hmm. your, but you know, you, you, you don't know if like, it's just cause that's the period we're in. So it seems like it's that heightened, but was there anything in your research that sort of you looked at and said, oh yeah, okay. We've been politically divided as a country for a, a long time here. And this is kind of yeah. similar to what you're saying. So, yeah. I feel more in the latter camp that there are some unique things going on right now. Um, you know, I, I steer clear of politics just because I don't think it's my role as a financial historian to, to cross that bridge. But, you know, it, what I think is overblown, I've heard a lot of people talking about that what we're experiencing right now is a lot like the 1930s. And, and there are some elements that are similar, but I actually don't think we're, we're similar to that. Things in the 1930s were horrific. I mean, we had basically average unemployment of 20% for like a decade. And you had massive instability in Germany and, and Japan. I, I don't, this doesn't strike me as that severe. Um, the, the period that seems most similar, although I, I wouldn't say it's, you know, like we're going through it again, is kind of the sixties and seventies where you had a lot of disagreement on social issues and, and changes. You had a a lot of disagreement on where government spending would go. And then you had some inflationary pressures and, um, that, that seems to me the most similar, but I, I you know, I, I don't think there's a great comparison if you're just looking at the political environment of where we are now versus somewhere else in, in us history. What right about again. it's the, that's a harder one to answer. Yeah, that's, that's fair. Um, what about the idea of a trend towards, I guess, more deglobalization. So us maybe after COVID bringing some of these supply chains back to yeah. the home shores and manufacturing back home. I'm thinking, does that all correlate with what happened after World War One or World War Two? Yeah, I, that, that's the thing that I don't think it nearly to the level. What, what are the problems with that led up to World War Two? Was the beggar the neighbor trade policies? where different countries would keep erecting different trade barriers and global trade really collapsed and all else being equal that that is problematic. Well, for a couple of reasons, one, it countries that are inter interdependent are less likely to fight each other in combat because it's just, it's too costly to depend on each other too much. So the more that gets reduced, the less barriers you have to, to war. The second thing is. I talk about this in the book, but I mean, the Great Depression and, and the beggar thy neighbor trade policies really is what prompted the, the outbreak of World War II. And it was especially impactful in Japan because Japan was a country that relied so much on generating foreign currency from their exports and, and the, the collapse in trade left them bankrupt essentially. And that forced them, they have no natural resources in Japan, so they had to get them somewhere. And that one of the solutions was essentially invading Manchuria and then, and then moving south through China. So the, I have, I haven't seen, you, you know, we had some tariffs under Trump. I, and I think I've heard that there's more talk of that, but I, you know, that's, that's not at the level that was present in the, in the early 1930s. I know in the book you talked about some of the lessons that you drew from this. And I, and I want to get to that in a minute or two, but I'm just curious on, um, you know, the country has largely 50 years ago, there was much more pension plans and people in retirement depended much more on pensions. 
Mm-hmm. And we've, corporate America has, you know, largely migrated away from that. Although interestingly enough, I saw a recent uh, article that IBM is actually reopening its pension yeah, plan because totally. they're actually going to save money. Um, yeah. But I'm just curious, like, what, what are given your perspective of the history of our country, do you think that's been net good or net bad for well, I, you know, I think also some misunderstanding of why pensions were established. Uh, so, you know, a lot of the state pensions were established because, you know, a lot of state employees are not eligible for Social Security. So that's kind of the form of Social Security at state level and, and local. Level. But e- even the corporate pensions that were established in the, the, the 40s and 50s, that was to avoid taxes. So if you look at tax rates back then, they were extraordinarily high. And corporations were making a lot of money because of the arsenal of democracy, which was the the buildup for World War II. So a lot of, so pensions were a way of compensating people without getting taxed. So I I think there's a little misperception that, that pensions were established just for the well-being and future of workers, that there were some ulterior motives there. But, you know, at at a big picture level, the United States, Americans do have a problem with saving. A lot of people are unprepared for retirement and it, it's a big problem. I, I guess the, the only caveat I would say, it, it's not like corporations and governments were so heavily focused on that back then. It was, there were a lot of reasons other than that, that led to the development of a lot of these plans. One of the other things I think that you talk about in the book is um, sort of how you personally have maybe gravitate a little bit more towards index funds um, yes. and, and to low cost investing. And, you know, that is clearly, you know, there, there's the argument how much passive is influencing the market. And obviously more and more investors have migrated to passive investment strategies, low cost strategies. Mm-hmm. Do, you any, do you have any, I guess, feelings or thoughts on whether or not, you know, and there's that famous Ben Graham quote, like, you know, in the short run, the market is a voting machine. In the long run, it's a weighing machine. And, and some people argue that the passive flows are kind of taking fundamental investing sort of out. And it's just based on sort of where the flows are going. So this isn't necessarily a historical question, but I'm just wondering your thoughts on it in general. If you have I mean, my, my thesis on, it, on passive is just really the evidence that it's it's just very difficult for anybody. There's like two derivatives of it too. It's very difficult for anybody to outperform the market. And it's even more difficult for people to identify people who can outperform the market, you know, so like picking managers. So, you know, dealing with institutions, it, it, it takes a while to see the same, to see the same cycles over and over, but it's actually particular. I actually think passive is actually more appropriate for institutions because they're run by committees that turn over so frequently. I often joke that, that working with an investment committee is like working with a client that has their personality change every, every four or five years. So you have these cycles of where they go into investments at the wrong time and then get out of them at the wrong time, hire and fire managers, you know, fire them at the peak, hire them at the bottom and I'm I'm sorry, uh, fire them at the bottom and, and hire them at the peak. And it just repeats over and over. So it's almost like indexing using passive as a hedge against the instability of governance for institutions. And then for individuals, you know, there's a significant cost savings and it's just very hard to outperform the market. And the reason is because there's just so much, you can't manipulate the market anymore. I mean, I guess you can, if you're doing a GameStop thing, um, and insider trading is illegal. That's how people used to make money in the market for like 170 years. And once that got eliminated, it just, it, it, the market's too efficient to outperform reliably over a long period of time. Do you think in, in any way, I'm just wondering, like based on your study of history, do you think active management is harder now? Like with, with everything that's happened with technology, do, do you think thing. it's always been a problem or do you think it's more difficult now? Incrementally, I think it probably is, but it wasn't easy. That's one of the funniest things. So if you go back to the, before the Securities Exchange Act of 1934, which outlawed market manipulation and insider trading. The way you made money on Wall Street was not analyzing securities. It was manipulating the market, doing quarters, doing bear raids, doing using stock pools to manipulate the stock. Insider trading was legal. So they they kind of knew that it, it didn't really make sense to 
analyze securities, even in the 1800s, so you just manipulated the market and, and did insider trading. That's how you made money. So it, it's a fundamental, there's a, a chapter in the book where, um, I talked about the concept of the wisdom of, of crowds, which is if you have something of uncertain value and everybody has the same information and they have to guess that value, the guesses above and the guesses below tend to cancel themselves out. And the average is actually pretty darn close to the real value. And it's very hard to beat that average. And that's just the principle that applies to economic forecasting. It applies to earnings estimates and it applies to pricing the value of a security. It's just very, it's very hard to be able to figure out something. If everybody has the same amount of information that is meaningful and different. And that's why it's hard to outperform markets. Yeah. And I wonder if it got harder from the perspective of, you know, if you think back in the day, like if you wanted to analyze the fundamentals of a company, you might have to go to the library. You might have to get the information. Yeah. Like it's there probably, at least might be really. some edge in trying to obtain it. But today it's like, everything is, you know, you can get it on your fingertips. So I can go on the internet right now and I can get yeah. whatever I want. I, I would, I, I, you're probably right, but it's almost like splitting hairs. It's been, a, it's been sufficiently efficient for a while. Now, whether they've squeezed a little more out, maybe, maybe not, but it, there wasn't much more to squeeze. In my opinion. You sort of end the book, not sort of, I think you end the book on a positive note with the, in the last chapters, reflections on the past and the shadows of America's future. And you sort of, you know, present the case that, listen, we've been through a lot as a country, our financial history, we haven't been perfect. We have like a lot of battle scars, yeah. but you know, like betting against America is probably not the side that you would want to take. So I just didn't know as we kind of get towards the end here, if you want to flush that out a little bit. You know, it, it's, um, and I'll comment on, I, I know there's another issue that we discussed on, I'll go deeper into it, but I went into this kind of pessimistic about the United States, but then I found out after reading newspapers from a hundred years ago, 150, 200 years ago, there's always, every generation thinks they're the last one that, that, you know, the world's going to going to hell and you know, this, this is it. And to be honest with you, I think there are a lot of situations in us history, whether there is a, a better argument. I mean, living in, in 1941, 1942, it did look like the world was coming to an end living in the 1840s. It, it, it was, it was a disaster. Um, so it, it just kind of taught me that th things happen worse in this country, significantly worse, and we get through it. And I, I think some of the, the enduring values that we have in the United States will enable us to, to get through the, the next crisis. And that is hard work and being a people that likes to improve things. Now, is everybody like that? No, but I think we have an, enough people that believe in fixing things, making things, thing, thing, making the world a better place, innovating. And I don't think that spirit has died in the United States. Now, I do, I do think we have some unique challenges. I think the debt is, we didn't get into this, but I think that is actually the biggest challenge that we have in this country is a very different mentality than it used to be. But um, I have faith in, in the American system. I really do. Well, let's flush the debt thing out before I kind of have the final two questions for you. So just generally, I mean, what are we now? So we're at, I think after COVID with all the fiscal stimulus, I know the Fed's balance sheet was sitting around 8 trillion, I think roughly something like that. And the national debt is like north of 30 trillion, if I have my numbers correct, 30 something like trillion. That. What yeah. concerns me about the debt is less the number and more the mentality. So if you look back to 1790, when Alexander Hamilton repaired the financial system, we were in disarray. I mean, we we're bonds issued by the former colonies that then states and the continents of Congress were trading at like 20 cents on the dollar in a lot of cases. And Alexander Hamilton, what he did is he consolidated the debt, raised tariffs and created a system to, to pay it down. And two of the principles that he establishes, one, it's critical for a nation to have excellent credit because when there's an emergency, mostly foreign war is what he termed it. That's when you need to use it. Even if you're a wealthy nation, you need to use that debt. And, and that's what we did. In the war of 1812, we did it in the civil war, world war one and world war two. But he also said that it was very important once the, once the emergency subsides to pay down the debt. And we did that after those wars, except for world war two. And the reason is first of all, we had the, the new dominant reserve currency. So we can just, you know, 
to, that gives you more freedom to issue debt. But, um, there's also a change in mentality that was a function of our perceptions of wealth. So after World War II ended, first of all, we had gold was kind of money under Bretton Woods and, and we had 70% of the world's gold reserves. So we, it's like we had all the money in Monopoly, you know, and, and more importantly, the whole world was destroyed. I mean, the infrastructure of Europe, Russia, uh, China, the, the, the infrastructure of Japan, their, their infrastructure was destroyed and ours was actually massively increased because we were, we were building everything for our allies. So we had tremendous wealth and we had tremendous ability to continue generating more wealth. And that gave us a different perception of, 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 of poverty, um, and our ability to fund social programs. And where we kind of turned was in the 1960s under the great society, where the goal was not just to, you know, reduce poverty, poverty was to eliminate it entirely. And that's when we started a lot of the programs that seemed affordable at the time because we we're tremendously wealthy, but as the rest of the world caught up, caught up, they became less affordable. And that's the hardest thing that we have to deal with right now, because nobody remembers what it was like before then this nation, you know, it is definitely the, the fiscal deficits are, are by definite, I mean, they're, they're unsustainable. I mean, just, you can just do the math. And then the challenge is nobody remembers that spending was not only like always like this, the way the debt used to work was it was used during times of emergency primarily and paid down after. And I, it's going to be hard to convince uh, Americans that that's, we, we can't keep doing this because that we've been doing it for so long. That's tough, tough mindset changes. That's all you've ever known, you know? Yeah. So, um, uh, well, thank you for that. That was, um, I'm glad we hit that. Um, so kind of just to, to wrap it up, two last questions. What do you think the biggest lesson for the average investor is mm -hmm. from, from the book? And do you have a biggest lesson that you've taken away that might be similar or might be different than what you think the they average investor should take away? And they probably be the same, which is the way that I'll start with the second question first, because this is what I hope to communicate to others. I was... I had a weird experience. So there's a woman named uh, Moitheri Wahome who wrote the financial history of South Africa. And we were, we were doing this at the same time and didn't know that we were both writing financial histories of our, of our countries. And we, and we met online and we talked about it. And we we're talking about that. And then at the end about how this changed us. And she said, you know, it just makes me more calm. I, 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 looking at 200 years, it's kind of like you've seen it all. And when something happens, you, 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 first of all, sometimes you instantly know what's the comparable and, and how this could play out. And you just no longer get panicky about, about stuff that comes out in the news because you, for the most part, you've seen it before. And that, that's, that's the way it's changed me the most. And in terms of value for the book, that's what I'm hoping to communicate. I hope that when people walk through this book, that they get some of that sense of calm, that it's very rare to see something even if it seems catastrophic in the moment, that is really going to be catastrophic. This nation is very resilient. America, the American people are very resilient. And we've seen very bad times before and we've, and we've come through them. And I think we will again. And that's, that's how it's changed me. And I, and I hope that, um, that some, uh, that I can help people have that feeling. Good stuff, Mark. We wish you all the best with the book. Thank you for joining us. All right. Thank you. Thank you both for having me. Thank you. This is Justin again. Thanks so much for tuning into this episode of Excess Returns. You can follow Jack on Twitter at, at PracticalQuant and follow me on Twitter at, at JJ Carboneau. If you found this discussion interesting and valuable, please subscribe in either iTunes or on YouTube or leave a review or a comment. We appreciate it. Justin Carboneau and Jack Forehand are principals at Validia Capital Management. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Validia Capital. No information on this podcast should be construed as investment advice. Securities discussed in the podcast may be holdings of clients of Validia Capital.